What's the problem? The problem is inheritance. So what that happens in language is that words that are different from the slur terms, not related to the slur terms, but are pronounced the same way or written the same way, so they have something in common with their articulation, wind up becoming soiled. Right? We call this the inher- problem of inheritance. So for example, as you said before, this adverb. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Became bad, not because it was a bad word, but because it had a bad sound. It, it sounded a lot like the N-word, right? So the point being is that um, it looks as though the the uh, culprit is not the expression, not the word per se, because it around to have two things. First of all, if you mispronounce the word significantly, what far from its canonical standard pronunciation, probably you won't get the sting. This thing won't happen. You, you could still get a moral judgment later down the road when you say, oh, did you realize when he said that, he was saying the N-word? Said, really? That guy, he's a bastard. He should be banished from this class. So all these reactions, but not the sting. The sting wasn't there because he didn't recognize the sting because it wasn't familiar to you. The sting is brought to you by its articulation. You learn about the sting from articulation. The thing is, whenever you're presented with a word, whenever I, this is another book and articles I've written, whenever you're presented with a word, you're presented with an articulation of the word. You cannot present a word without articulating it. But the articulation is not identical. So the problem is that forever and ever and ever in the metaphysics of language, people have thought that the articulation of a word is part of the word. If you look, look at the Chomsky tradition and so on, if you say, what are, what are words? They have a phonological component. That's confusion. Notice the following. I'll give you a little thought experiment. Imagine. Well, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the the reason that I immediately think that this is not true is because of a case like Helen Keller, where there she might grasp a word, but for her, there is no sound associated with it at all. But there's this, right? There's this. You, true. That's yeah, the, absolutely. So um, the tactile sensation. So what I'm is the reason why I mentioned this is that we usually when we talk about articulation, we talk about phonology or, or graphemics, you know. Well, that's such, that's because we're limited and boring. But in fact, uh, you could you could smoke English, you can you know, smoke signals, you can uh, Morse code English, you can yeah yeah yeah. It's sign. There's actually something called sign English. Not 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 just the uh, what's standardly taught to people who are deaf, but ASL ASL. Not that, not just ASL. There's actually something called sign English. Um, okay. So. There are lots of, there, only your imagination will limit you how you could articulate English. You could articulate English in all sorts of ways. Imagine the following. Imagine you had three people who are all competent in English, right? It's a really easy thought experiment. So three people that are equally competent in English, except the following distinguishes them. One guy can read in English and write English, but he can't speak it. And he can't sign it. One can sign it, but he can't read it or write it or speak it. One can speak it, but he can't write, sign, or read. So they can't communicate. Why? Not because they don't share a language. They all speak English. They're all totally proficient in English. They don't share a, a system of articulation. So their articulation is obviously different from the language because they both know English. What they don't know is they don't know how to articulate English in the same way. So if you want to communicate with That them, is that's, really nice. Here's what's mind-boggling. No one's ever seen that. That's a shocking. That's like a distinction which is plucked. It's like <laughs> yeah. hanging fruit. That, well, here's a distinction. I thought when I first got I, I knew Umberto Echo pretty well. I called him up and I said, Umberto, you're a medievalist. Did the medievalist are, because you think this is something the medievalist was had in mind. No, not aware of it. Semioticians, not aware of it. It's bizarre because it's looked like it's an obvious distinction to make. But the problem is that everybody in the, and his mother were shaped the earth about word individuation. If you look at Donald Davidson's paper on words um, and anything else, you know, uh, who else I have in mind that you would see right away? Well, Capellan wrote on this. A lot of people wrote on this. Uh, Lewis. Um, Kaplan, Perry, all these people were, were uh, identified the word with its shape. Now, that's a crazy view if you think about it, because what's the common shape between a spoken English word and a written English word? If the word's identified with a shape, what shape is that? What, what kind of shape is it that transfers over from spoken to written? And of course, as you noted immediately, which is very good on your part, is that those are just two ways of articulating this. You could articulate English with smoke signals, you know, with sign symbols, with who knows, Morse code, anyway. You can imagine all sorts of ways of creating new ways of articulating English. Um, but they're all independent of English. English exists. Now we're showing you how to put it in, how to map it in a way that you can get something from it. So what I claim is that sometimes 
when you're presented with a word and its articulation, the association attaches to the articulation, not to the word, but to the articulation. How do you know that? Because if you mispronounce the word, they don't get the same associations. They're not provoked. And if you and if you say a word which is, is like it, phonologically or graphemically like it, you get the same kind of associations, even if I don't want to have them. So if you say the N word with the L-Y on the end, immediately people who know the etymology, they know it's not connected historically, they still say, ooh, ooh please don't, can you use another word. Use, just use another, banish that word. That word is essentially not usable anymore. And that happens all the time. So think about children. One of the favorite games of children is to trick their parents or their friends into saying some word fast three times and it sounds like an N word. They say, oh, it sounds like a slur term of some sort. It's a game they play all the time with each other. They try to get you to say some bad word. You don't actually say the bad word, but it sounds like you say the bad word because you, if you say this one good word three times fast, you know, it sounds like the bad word. So they, so they still get blamed for, made fun of or whatever, ridiculed. Yeah, yeah, talking, yeah. Even though it's it's not that word, you didn't you didn't use the word. You clearly didn't intend to use the word. If you if you use the word, you use it by accident. You use, what you did is you use the homophone. You said something that sounds like it, and you're punished for that. You're ridiculed for that. Mm -hmm. So we argue there's yeah. lots of data that shows that slur slurring can be inherited by an association that's attached not to the word itself but to the articulation of the word. That's a new view. Mm -hmm. it sounds crazy on its face, but. This, this is not it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds crazy, but it's so neat. <laughs> I really like yeah. it. It's funny you mentioned these games. Uh, this is, I mean, going to sound childish on this academic podcast. With, I remember this game when, well, it wasn't a game, but it's sort of in the same spirit of what you said. I, I When I was in, I don't know, second grade, third grade, first grade, you would tell somebody to say, to spell I cup and then say funny colors. And then you would say, you would then think about it, and then you'd say, I C U P funny colors. And I don't know why, but it was always like, I, my it was kid always a that, joke. And it's, I figured that all the time when he was little. All the time he did that. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, it survived. It survived you. It's, it continues on into history. But there also yeah. doesn't. Like yeah. But, so, so it's just interesting that uh, how important the articulation is because clearly, you, well, the point is that you have no idea what you're saying, but the mere fact that you've articulated it uh, gives it some sort of force. Right. And I'll tell you this. If you don't intend to say the A word, N word, but someone tricks you into saying it, it causes pain. There's no doubt in my mind that it causes pain. So mm -hmm. but Liz doesn't get this. She thinks the pain's necessary. Matthew and Ona, they both freak out. They, 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 that's why she came up with the uh, mud blood. She said that, uh, even then she said, I know it's going to offend some people. Big fans of Harry Potter are going to be happy about this, but I'll risk it. It's the risk I could take. But I mean, basically, it's a topic. It's the it's topic that shall not be mentioned. You know, you can't you can't use you can't use any of the expressions that you're talking about in order to to, to do their semantics or pragmatics or their or their just the historical facts about them. It's so wild. Mm -hmm. But I I came no. around to this. You know, after a while, I was so up. One thing that's fascinating is I one time gave a lecture in Northwest and it was a big cognitive science lecture, maybe 150 people in the room. And there were, it's coincidentally in that room was sitting the chair of African American studies, chair of Latino studies, and the chair of LGBT studies. All three of them were in the room. And they were arguing against me because I said, you can't use these words ever. And they said, well, I can use them in my classroom. And what they did was interesting because in the classroom, they're comfortable. They know who everybody is. You know that it's acceptable. They understood this house rule, but in this big hall, but they don't know who they are. And they and what they showed that they they were aware of this at some level, because when they actually token the expressions that they claim they could use all the time in their classrooms without any trouble, they lowered the decibel about 180 percent. So they said, "I say this all the time. I say N I G E R. You know, they spell it out or something like that very quietly. I said, "What? I couldn't hear anything." So in some sense, at some level. Their body was correcting for their intentions. They wanted it out of this work because they wanted to show that they were bigger than the, the practice, but they couldn't do it. When they tried to do it, their body said, no, 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 silent, get a little low, lower, lower the decibels. The reason being that they don't know who these people are in the room. They don't know if they're offending them or not. That was my point. That's the point I was making. Hmm. But Matthew well, Stone, granted that the hives. 
I mean, if I said the N-word, quoted the N-word in front of him, he'd have hives. That's how anxious he was. <laughs>